So I'm going to talk today about what I call the steelhead portfolio, which is essentially analogous to the range and continuum of life histories that steelhead display. And I'd like to talk about those life histories today within the construct of recovery uh, of wild steelhead. And so some of the things that uh, Kurt alluded to earlier about the value of all these life histories in steelhead, I think he raised a really important point about uh, how valuable those are to the resilience of steelhead populations and how that life history needs to be accounted for when we manage our fish. Uh, before I get into that, I want to first thank some of the people that provided data and uh, also reviewed the presentation. Uh, Mike Gross, George Pess, uh, Jeff Hard, Mike McHenry, Neela Kendall, just a tremendous amount of people, Dave Flugett, Connor, all these folks, a lot of people provided information and, and looked at the uh, presentation. And some of you might have seen this before because I first gave it about, um, I don't know, probably a year ago at a TRT meeting. Uh, I simplified it a little bit and shortened it. Um, so really today what I want to talk about is what makes a steelhead a steelhead? Because Omicus are unlike any other salmonid that we have. And the reason that they're unlike any other salmonid that we have is because of the diversity and range of life histories that they display. I'd like to talk about that today, as I mentioned, within the context of viability and recovery. And within that context, what are the next steps we think are important to take to begin to include life history diversity in our management models? The construct, of course, that we manage a lot of our steelhead under, particularly those that are recovered or, be, or recovering or being listed or are listed under the ESA Act, is the viable salmon population model that was developed by McElhaney et al. And that contains four components that are important to steelhead resilience uh, and population sustainability. That includes abundance. And abundance, of course, is really uh, the single main factor that we use to manage steelhead today. But there are also other various components, including productivity of the population, the spatial structure and distribution of the population, and life history diversity. One of the reasons a steelhead is a steelhead really is because, again, of all this life history diversity. And today I want to talk about three aspects of that life history diversity that I think are particularly relevant to VSP. And that first includes age and size at maturity, the extent of anadromy, and iteroparity or repeat spawning. And again, here's a photo of some wild steelhead holding together. And, and I continually go back to why are steelhead different from all of these other salmon that we manage? And if you think about it, most of our salmon management models came from a single common faucet of ricker and sockeye salmon in Alaska. And sockeye salmon are fairly unique among uh, Pacific salmon because they do have a resident life history, that is kokanee, yet they have a very simple set of anadromous life histories that they display. So all of the management assumptions and models that we have are based upon a very simple species, and then we've taken that model and applied it to a very complex species. And I would argue that it's probably not benefiting how we manage these species. And today, I want to touch on a little bit about the Skagit River. All of the data in here is not from the Skagit, if only because the data collected on the Skagit is good, that we have better data on steelhead in other places. Uh, but one of the things that makes steelhead relatively unique among the Pacific salmon species that we have in the Skagit is the fact that they are less variable in annual abundance than all these other species. And so here is pink salmon on the primary x-axis. Uh, this is essentially the annual run size. And what you can see is that we're seeing run sizes range from over a million and a half fish uh, to down to less than 100,000 fish in any given year. So they're highly variable. This is chum salmon on the secondary x-axis. You can see the chum, again, highly variable, going from over 400,000 fish in a certain year to less than 30,000 fish in given years. So we see these big peaks and troughs. In fact, it kind of looks like our economy prior to the last couple of years, not very good. Uh, then I'm gonna include Chinook and Coho. And what you can see here is that Coho are intermediate in variability. Uh, to the pink and the Chinook. And the Chinook, of course, being a smaller run size, having inherently less variability than the others. But when we look at steelhead down there, we put it on the same scale, it almost looks like a flat line, like a dead heartbeat. There's nothing there. And that is because 
the annual variability in steelhead run size is less. And we're going to go through a little exercise that indicates that, and then we're going to try and answer why is that the case. So what I did is a very simple step here, uh, certainly not peer review material, but I wanted to look at the total number of life histories that a fish displays. So what I did first was to look at how many freshwater life histories do we commonly see in the Skagit River, and that's about four. There's more, but that means that we see some one-year-old smolts, some two-year-old smolts, some three-year-old smolts, and some four-year-old smolts. Of course, there are older smolts, and one-year-old smolts are pretty rare, but in general, we have about four common freshwater life histories. The same is true for the ocean. One salt, two salt, three salt, four salt fish being the dominant fish. Uh, then we're gonna talk about run timing or race, and that refers to what we would call winter steelhead and summer steelhead. There are two of those. And that gives me a total of 10 life histories. And uh, if I was gonna do this again for a peer reviewed journal, I would do these life history uh, metrics a little differently, but this fits for this case and it essentially is the same regardless of how you do it. So we can look at all these other species, Chinook, Coho, Chum, and Pink, and add up all these life histories. And we can see that steelhead have 10, Chinook seven, all the way down the line to the most simple of all species, uh, which is pink salmon. So the question is, is there something underlying all that variability and abundance? And lo and behold, yes, there is. Uh, it is life history diversity. And what I did here on um, the bottom x-axis was compare the coefficient of variation for annual run sizes. This is essentially a measure of variability. So the higher the coefficient of variation for annual run sizes, the greater the variability in the run, uh, the smaller the coefficient of variation in annual run sizes, the smaller the run. And I compared that to the number of common life histories and I regressed those two using simple linear regression. Uh, it was a very significant value and actually this model um, explained amazingly over 75% of the variability in the annual run size. So what this does tell us is that the more life histories you have in the Skagit River, the less variation in annual abundance. And we wanna talk about why that is important and what is the reason, what are the mechanisms that are driving all of that life history variability that we see? The first is age and size at maturity. And for steelhead and micus in general, they are the most diverse of any salmonid we have, any salmonine as a matter of fact. There are at least 32 to 36 life history trajectories that a steelhead can follow to maturity. Uh, and this is based on work by Thorpe and Moore and Mesquina. Uh, but I think also that some of these haven't been identified. We're probably talking about a total range of life histories when you look to Kamchatka, where populations have not been altered as highly. In some of those rivers, we're seeing over 40 life histories. So there's a tremendous amount of diversity. Uh, part of that diversity is also what I would call the continuum of anadromy, and that is how long does a fish spend in freshwater before it goes out, and then how long does it spend in the ocean? Well, if you review all of the micus life history literature, you will see that we have smolts in some cases at the very extreme end that are nine years old. Uh, of course, most of them are two and three years of age, and the younger smolts tend to occur in the more southerly populations where growth conditions are better, and older smolts tend to occur in the more northerly populations where growth conditions are not as good. Of course, we know that some fish, some steelhead, uh, half pounders, maybe Dave, I think referred to them as quarter pounders, and I like that name a little bit better, spend only one to two months in the ocean be before returning to fresh water. And a lot of those fish are immature upon their first return, and a lot of them are male. They tend to be disproportionately male. And when they head back out to the ocean for their second time, they will again only stay typically a few months before returning uh, as a mature fish. Again, male, and we're gonna talk about a little bit later on why males and females do different things in micus because it's a bit like the 1950s with steelhead. Males and females really do different things. I would say that culturally and socially they haven't evolved as far as we have to the point now where we have women working in all the different types and professions they did in the 50s. The steelhead are holding true uh, as I would call it to the leave it to beaver model which is that women and men do different things and damn it that works so let's keep it that way. <laughs> And all of this cool stuff results in what I would consider to be a striking amount of variation in age and size that is absolutely unmatched by any other salmonid except for a few cases of Chinook. Uh, so I wanna talk about some of these different patterns about 
why girls and boys do different things and how those girls and boys actually match their life histories to their evolutionary needs. And here I'm going to use some work from the Kamchatka Peninsula. Again, I rely on Kamchatka because its populations haven't experienced hatcheries, they haven't experienced habitat degradation. They have been poached, so they've had over harvest, uh, but we have pre-poaching data, we have post-poaching data, so we can look at this. In Kamchatka, they typically see what we would call four major life histories. Uh, the first, of course, is fully anadromous. Those are fish that spend one to five years in the ocean. Older age at maturity, five to nine. Mean size at maturity is about 30 inches. Their typical fecundity, uh, anywhere from 6,000 to 12,000 eggs. The sex ratios of those fish in Kamchatka are mostly female. So this is interesting to us. Most of the girls, most of the fish that are going to the ocean and coming back are female. And we're gonna talk about why that is in a little bit. Uh, on the other hand, we have the quarter pounder, half pounder life histories here, which are estuarine fish. And those are fish that are essentially half pounders. They go out to the estuary, they come back typically immature on their first run. Um, but they do this repeatedly in Kamchatka. In fact, repeat spawning rates are so high that there are some fish in Kamchatka that I believe the maximum number of repeat spawners times for a single fish repeat spawning is 10. And it was an estuarine fish. So one male went out to the estuary and came back and spawned 10 times over his life. I think he was 14 or 15 years of age. What you'll see here is they mature at a younger age and a smaller size, and they're mostly male. We also have what we call river estuarine life histories, and those are fish that kind of become rainbow trout uh, and then out migrate to the ocean at a relatively large size later in life and spend very little time in the ocean. Again, they come back at a very small size, and they are mostly male. In some populations, they're entirely male. And then, of course, we have those fish that decide never to go to the ocean. So no years in the ocean, of course. Age at maturity, very similar to what we see with those estuarine and river estuarine fish. Mean size at maturity, again, very small compared to fully anadromous fish. Sex ratios, as with the other small fish, mostly, in some cases, entirely male. The question about why some fish why some life histories are dominated by males and why some are dominated by females is really comes down to a simple factor that science indicates that size at reproduction is more important to females than it is to, fe than it is to males for reproductive success later in life. And there's a reason for this. For females, it, the bigger you get, the more eggs you have or the larger eggs you have. And the more eggs you carry, the better chance you have at producing offspring because survival is really piss poor from zero to fry for steelhead. That's when most of these fish die. Uh, the reason that we can have many fish return at a small size and be male is because males have what we would call a really diverse set of behavioral tactics. We have the sneak tactic, we have the mimic tactic, and we have the guard tactic. And so all those big fish you see out there, those are what we call guards. They try and use aggression and violence to limit access to females. It is their job to try and keep every other male away. So he's like the six by six bull elk that you see that's slobbering all over himself trying to beat up every other elk out there. The problem with being big is that there's very few big males. How many Arnold Schwarzeneggers do we have on this earth? Not very many, which means that all the rest of us that range in size from 200 pounds to 150 still get a girl, still get to have sex and reproduce. And that's a great thing that all of us small guys can still have sex and find mates. And still have it the same way. Some of the small fish will never develop secondary sexual characteristics such as a deep red stripe or a kipe. And those fish are what we call mimics. They will hide in the red acting like a female. And when the female leaves the red, they will occupy that red and act like they're digging. The male will say to himself, he kind of looks different, but he's acting like a girl. And you got to remember, a steelhead's brain is really small. And so he figures, screw it, I don't care. <laughs> By the time he realizes it is a male, it's too late. The guy's out the bedroom door and you had no chance to catch him with your wife. The residents, on the other hand, and all these other little guys are what we call sneakers. And that is, they're like, I don't want violence. You're way too big, dude. I'm going to hold 10 feet to the right of you. And at the minute that you are incapacitated, when you go to release your sperm, I'm going to swim out on the other side of the female where you can't see me and release the sperm. And some of those sneakers actually will spend their entire breeding time underneath the female. 
Some of them are so small that you'll never see them from bank. And I learned this the hard way when I first started doing steelhead observations of breeding behavior, that we will have three to eight inch long male resonant rainbow that hide under the female. And sometimes you'll have as many as up to 10 of those fish hiding under a female. And this is not uncommon. This is very common in Atlantic salmon. In fact, in Atlantic salmon, in some populations, 90% of the anadromous offspring are fathered by small resident males. So the question for us is, do we have this similar diversity in size here in North America? And what I decided to do was look at that in the Quileute system. For those of you who don't know, I've lived in Forks, Washington, or at least in that neck of the woods since 1997, and spent a lot of my free time uh, I don't have kids, I have a wife who loves me, but there was about 12 years where I had nothing but fish on the mine. And so all I did after work or even during work was go out and try and observe steelhead and see what I could find. And what we have here is my own personal angling data because I also fish a, fish a ton. So uh, people might ask, why use angling data? We have tribal catch data on the quilly. Well, there's a problem with the tribal catch data is it truncates the true range of diversity that we see. And that's for one reason is the mesh size is large enough so that they never catch, they catch very few one salt fish, they don't get any of the estuarine fish, and they don't really tell us anything about resonance. The second reason is that almost all netting ends in mid-April. So what we end up with is no samples for those fish that are coming in late in the spawning season. On the other hand, uh, the fly, the fishing season on the quail is pretty much open year round. I can go out and sample fish, and so what we're looking at here is I think about 500 fish that I caught over maybe <coughs> a seven or eight year period. This is the range in size, the frequency of different sizes for female steelhead. What you see is almost a normal distribution, a little bit skewed, but you can see that most of the fish are somewhere between 26 to 29 inches in length. Uh, really very rare to catch a fish over 40 inches. I think Sean Gallagher told me he got a 40 inch hen in the Queets this year and all the fish I've caught, which is over 1500 steelhead on the OP, I've never caught a 40 inch hen. Um, a lot of 40 inch males, but 40 inch hens are rare. Uh, which highlights what we see in males, is that males have a much greater range in sizes than we see in females. You can see the very biggest individuals, always male, and the very smallest individuals, again, are always male. So the range in diversity is greater. It's almost like we're managing two different species when we just look at these different sexes. And this is a visual example. This is a 39-inch male from the Ho River. Um, I think at a 22 inch girth is probably pushing 25 pounds. Uh, and then we have what we would call one of these little quarter pounders, a 16 inch guy who's had very few snacks in life, but he understands too that Danny DeVito, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger, has always managed to find plenty of wives. And this is what they look like in real life, very small fish. He's less than half the length of that other turkey. Uh, of course, we also have those that are resonant. Some of these little guys never go to the ocean. And this is a resonant rainbow, uh, presumably a male, um, about 13 inches in length. And we wonder how do these little resonant rainbows, I talked about this, they become sneakers, and this is kind of an example of what we see with a sneaker. Uh, what we have here is the dark fish that's large on the top is a male steelhead. The bottom one that has the nice uh, sea line on her back is a female, and those are about seven pound fish and the rainbow trout below it's about a 16 inch fish and i watched these fish over a period of three days and every time the big male got some sperm released so did the little guy uh, the question is is how successful are these little males well damn it they're far more successful than you might think in fact a lot of the steelhead you are catching have danny devito as their dad uh, <laughs> siemens at all christy at all up to 50% of the steelhead in any given population have a resonant male dad. But it's not only the males. Uh, Barry Berzikian has done some great work in the Hood Canal streams, and in any given year, zero to 50% of the juveniles are coming from female resonant rainbow trout. Uh, Zimmerman and Reeves, uh, Mark Christie, Ian Quarter done some great work in the interior, uh, the Deschutes River, the Hood River, the Yakima, in those cases, zero to 20% of adults came from female resident rainbow trout. This is important. In Hood River, Mark Christie found that up to 40% of the steelhead genes were derived from resonants, and that those genes were absolutely fundamental to diluting the effects of interbreeding with hatchery fish. 
That raises the question, what about resonant rainbow sizes? So again, here is my own personal catch data for resonant rainbows, and I only include males here because the male, uh, the resonant rainbow trout in the Quileute system are about 80% male. There are very few females, but what we can see is uh, when you add in the resonant male component, we end up with what we would call a bimodal distribution of males. That means we have two peaks, one for small fish and one for big fish. And it extends all the way from 43 to 44 inches in length, all the way down to eight inches. We don't have a management model that accounts for this type of complexity yet, although I know some people are working on them. But eight inches isn't the smallest size that these little guys can reach. In fact, some of them are much smaller. I did my graduate work in the John Day River and my focus was trying to understand why one fish becomes a resonant rainbow trout and why another becomes a steelhead. And since that's been uh, the focus of much of my research, what we can see in the John Day River is that some of these fish were maturing uh, at, a, at age one at only three inches in length. So one year of life, three inches long. We're not even talking Danny DeVito here. We're talking the guy that's in Game of Thrones, that good actor, the little dude they call the imp. That's these guys, man everybody gets a chance to reproduce. So if you've all seen Game of Thrones, and I thought I would hate it when I started, but now I'm addicted, and I'm looking at that little guy going, he is the resident rainbow trout. But again, it's really hard to manage for these guys. And so we call these little residents with big, bom big moms, this mature male, uh, we pulled him out. We thought his belly was actually full of grasshoppers. Uh, we killed him and found out that lo and behold, he was packing heat. Those are milt sacks. <laughs> Those are milt sacks. This is September 14th. And this fish is essentially fully mature. One of the reasons he's fully mature, why the hell would you be mature in September if you're not gonna spawn till April because most of those fish in the John Day are very late spawning fish. Our hypothesis is that he is up at about 5,000, 6,000 feet elevation. The creek ices over all winter. The only opportunity he's gonna have for further development to ensure that he hits that window of spawning is to be mature by the time that ice breaks and the water temperature is warm. There's not gonna be adequate time for further development. This was surprising to me, but when you go back to historical records and when David Starr Jordan came out to the Columbia in 1905 and he looked at the Deschutes River, at that period in time, half the males that he sampled were fully mature. They weren't running milt, but their milt sacks were as sexually developed as you could get and that was in early October. So it either highlights that we had earlier spawning than we currently think historically in the Columbia, or that these fish are, as my dad has called them, kind of the ice runners. That is, you come in mature and you live under the ice the entire winter, like a lot of these fish probably do, and the ice cover reduces their metabolism, makes them completely nocturnal. In fact, ice cover for salmonids can reduce their metabolism by up to 50%. So you're not burning calories, you don't have much food, uh, but you've got enough to get mature. And what they do is burn their fat stores. They live off the fat interest that they have garnered during those summer months. We have these in the Quileute too. This is a six inch resident male that I caught from behind a spawning pair on June 7th in the North Fork Kalawa, and he was running milk. He was very unhappy that I caught him, and one of the interesting things about his fish is he kept flaring his fins at me in the tank because I assumed he thought I was competition, but I wasn't. So now when we think of all these fish sizes, we got the 16-inch the quarter pounder, you, you got the, the big Arnold Schwarzenegger, and then you got a six-inch fish the head on the 39 inch fish was 13 and a half inches long. He's not even half the size of the head of the other one. We got Peter Dinklage totally going on here. So the big question is, I wanna show you a little example of how they actually all accomplished. I wanna let this play for a little bit. There he goes and there come the others. We're gonna play it again. So what you'll see is a little turkey, there he goes and darts under, nobody saw me, the male doesn't know. Thank you. <laughs> he was actually hiding behind my camera lens and using that as cover. And what I found when you look at these steelhead pairings on the Quileute is the average number of male mates was two to three. Those were just anadromous mates. Once I got underwater, the average number of mates for one female steelhead on a red was six to nine. So half of these were little resident males. 
And the interesting thing is not all of them are just releasing their sperm. A lot of these fish, when they get done releasing their sperm, they stop, they turn their head down, and eat the eggs they just fertilized. <laughs> Another interesting thing about these little guys, and they found this with Atlantic salmon, is that when you're small and hidden, they can block the sperm of the larger males with their back. And this has been found in Atlantic salmon. So it's not only that you're sneaky, uh, but when you get under there, you also have a back that can be used for something. We wanna talk now, I think, about the last thing that I think is very important, which is repeat spawning in steelhead, or the extent of iteroparity. And what we see is that there is a tremendous amount of variability in the extent of repeat spawning. And I'm gonna look at it here from a latitudinal perspective and again, remind people that although this is data on iteroparity, we don't have very good data on iteroparity. And it's really hard to read scales accurately across lots of populations and get a good sense. But what I will say is that in 1966, Widler did a very nice piece of research and he looked at iteroparity latitudinally. And in 1966, the highest rates of iteroparity were in California and Southern Oregon, and it sharply declined as you moved north towards Alaska. So here we have Russia and the rest of the world. We see a pattern now that is exactly the opposite of what Whitler saw in 1966. And what we can see here is Puget Sound uh, in the middle there, somewhere around 10, 12, 15%. You can see in Russia and Alaska. In Russia, some populations, 75% fish are repeat spawners, very high levels. In Alaska, we're seeing over uh, 55, 58% in some places. We do have a small peak down there, Oregon South Coast and the Coquille, uh, again, you know, somewhere up there to almost 50%, but generally there's a trend that we see latitudinally with the decline in iteroparity. What this matches up with to me is essentially as you have more humans, you have more hatchery fish and you have more people catching fish, we see lower levels of iteroparity. There is strong evidence that historically we had much higher rates of iteroparity, for example, in 1951, they did some research in Tillamook and sampled 500 fish out of the Tillamook Bay on the Oregon coast. Repeat spawn rates at that time were 57%. And I think they had one male that spawned, repeat spawn four times. And almost all the fish uh, spawned, of course, repeat spawned only once, but they had 40% of the fish that repeat spawned more than two times. So there was a tremendous amount of iteroparity that we had back then that we don't see now. There's also a temporal component to variation in iteroparity. And here I'm gonna use the Queets uh, and the, and the uh, Ho River. And what we can see in the Queets is this is from period of record from 1980 to 2012. We can see there was a very sharp peak there in that great ocean survival period in the mid 80s where we're seeing about half the population with uh, being repeat spawners. There was another slight peak in that 2000 to three year, but general what we see is kind of a decline or maybe a sharp peak and then a flat line. But the interesting thing about this is I think people assume that because one river uh, has a certain level of iteroparity that another river that's only a few miles next door is going to follow the same pattern. That is the hoe and the black line and what you can see are the peaks and troughs generally match each other for that time period, about 10 years. On the other hand, you go to the next 10 years and what we see is literally no connection. In fact, we see the opposite. What we tend to see here is that years when you have a downswing, you have an upswing, when you have an upswing, you have a downswing, they're not matching each other, suggesting that this is not all about ocean conditions, because all of these fish are entering the ocean literally within 15 miles of each other. And as far as I know, all the research that I've seen from folks that have collected out there, there's very little difference. So we can have differences in iteroparity at a very small scale. We're not entirely sure of why that is. I've got a few hunches. One of the reasons is probably there are different levels of intensive commercial fisheries by tribes on those fish. And there are a number of Celts taken in those commercial fisheries. So it could be related uh, to intensity of, uh, the intensity of the fishery. But I don't wanna lay it all at the feet of tribal harvest because we as anglers uh, are also part of the problem. And I think uh, in Bob Hooten's great work that he looked at catch and release rates and our effect on fish, I think he's, he cited something from Kurt in there that talked about, um, I believe it was your work that talked about Celts 
tending to eat bait and swallow it more. And so it wasn't enough data to say that that is for certain an effect, but I would tend to think that a fish that is hungry is gonna have a higher level of mortality when you put a piece of bait in front of its face than a fish that is not hungry. Let alone that just us hooking and releasing kelts could have an effect because they've already got their fat stores typically down to about one to 2%. And once a fish gets that 1%, it's the swimming dead. One of the other things we wanna talk about again is we're gonna go back to uh, leave it to beaver here in the 1950s because women and men are not doing the same things. Uh, what we can see here is that most uh, repeat spawners are female, uh, anywhere from 70, 75%. Fewer of those are male. Uh, why is this the case? Well, there's a pretty common answer. We haven't tested it, but we think it's the reason. It's been looked at in Atlantic salmon more strongly, which is that males stay in the river system longer than females, trying to mate with as many females as possible. So when they leave, they're in a highly degraded state. They're less likely to survive. On the other hand, females tend to stay in fresh water for a very short period of time, relatively short period, then leave when they're in better shape. So the better condition you are in physically and physiologically when you out-migrate to the salt as a repeat spawner, the better it is for you. One thing we might underestimate is how many of these fish actually do make the migration back out to salt water. Work from the Fraser River on a catch and release study found that 70% of the steelhead they radio tagged Celted. Fraser River has about a 12% repeat spawn rate, so not many of those fish survived. But on the Elwha River, we've seen a similar number of fish. 75% have Celted for all the fish that we've radio tagged. A smaller number of fish, but a similar pattern, suggesting that we have quite a few Celts going out of the system in some watersheds. The conclusions for me are that we have this tremendous striking range in size at age and maturity in steelhead that is largely unmatched in any other salmonid. We've got these different components, including residency and iteroparity. They're also highly variable. I think we all know that. You go to a stream like the Deschutes River, 80% of the micus population is resident. You go to a place like the Quileute, 95% of the population is anadromous. There's tremendous variability in that. There are differences for males and females. What this really means to us is that when we're managing steelhead, we're not just managing an anadromous component of two and three-year-old smolts and two and three-year-old adults, what we're, two and three-year-old ocean fish. What we're really looking at is a size of fish that are residents from three inches all the way up to huge anadromous fish that are over 30 pounds. And again, I don't think there's a model for that right now. And this has a lot of implications for recovery because we are starting to, just the past year or two, incorporate to our best limited ability residents in recovery models. They're doing it for Hood Canal. They're trying it in Puget Sound. I've contributed to these. I think it's a very important start, but it's very hard to tease out because we don't have a lot of data on it. But the, the crux of the matter is the suite of life histories that they display are absolutely critical because as Moore et al. showed in their recent research in the Skeena and the Nass River, that all that life history div diversity buffers against variation in the environment. All of these life histories are essentially the analogy of not putting all your eggs in one basket. So pink salmon that put almost all their eggs in one basket, if they hit a bad ocean year, the, run, the run's going to look like crap. If they hit a good ocean year, it's gonna look great. Chinook are somewhere in the middle, but with steelhead, they have all these different ages at smolting and ocean age, and that allows them to essentially trump some of that environmental variability. What it does mean, of course, is that we're not gonna have the huge peaks and troughs that we necessarily see in other salmon. And I'd like to also talk about residency and repeat spawning because they not only increase diversity and spatial distribution, uh, but they also increase population size, and this is without increases in juveniles or smolt survival. So when we're talking about recovery in Puget Sound, everybody bemoans the fact that we have poor marine survival. I agree with that. Fortunately, it's recently upswinged a little bit, but one way to get more fish back is to start managing for higher levels of iteroparity because they're not smolts. They are smolts, they're just big ones, but they're not included in our models. So the more iteroparity we can have, the larger populations we can have without increasing smolt survival. I think the next step to all of this is really we've got to get away from the Ricker model for steelhead. And I wouldn't say all Ricker's models were bad. In fact, if you go back to 1976, there was a nice 
Ricker model that indicated that a species with steelhead that commonly displays over 10 life histories suggested the maximum harvest rate you should see on that type of species is 5 to 10 percent. Currently, on the Olympic Peninsula, we're harvesting in the Quileute 20 to 30 percent a year. In the Ho and Queets, it's exceeding 70 percent in some years. We cannot harvest steelhead at that high level because we never know the certain life histories we are mining versus those that have actually survived and contributed. And so what this means is we need to consider what I call portfolio effects. And these are taken, of course, from the financial world, which means that you want to have a diverse financial portfolio because it ensures that you're more likely to have something to retire on than say if you spend all your money in stocks and that's really great and then you hit the tech bubble and you're screwed. But if you'd had some in CDs, some in cash, some in bonds, you're probably gonna do a little bit better. And I wanna get laughed at by Brock, who I just talked to because he knows this way better than I do, but uh, we can see some of this in the cool Ute system. And the arrows here indicate years when we had a smaller percentage of two-year-old uh, smoles and a higher percentage of three-year-old smoles. And what you can see here is there is compensation. In years when you have poor survival of two-year-olds, we have higher survival of three-year-olds. And really, at the end of the day, I think all of this is about that tremendous diversity in steelhead, and that for us to manage these fish, we're going to have to jump outside the box of relying simply on abundance and start to include diversity metrics and, light, and also metrics about distribution and productivity. We need better measures in steelhead. We've done a, a decent job of accounting for abundance. We've done a poor job of accounting for life history diversity. But it's that type of diversity that's going to ensure we have steelhead fisheries in the future. Um, so thank you, and that is it.